So the chapter we are doing is this model building chapter. I think it kind of flowed from what we talked about on model basics uh, itself. I'm not sure if my camera works, so <laughs> I'll try to make this work. Um, so it, it flows from model basics itself. And the major idea of model basics literally is just an introductory chapter. Um, just okay. trying to walk through two major ideas here. Um, first bit is like what constitutes an actual model itself um, at okay. least in terms of this book and what should be the objective that we should be aiming for. So there were okay. two things that they were trying to teach us in this physics. The first bit was uh, um, um, cultivating the habit of using visualization to kind of understand the model itself and, and okay. reducing that model into an actual equation or a function. Then the second bit is understanding how to use residuals um, as a way to kind of build through what a best fit model will be. So okay. this, this introductory chapter is a lot more friendly if anybody has context on like linear regression and things like that. I think that's where oh. most of the ideas were pulled from. Oh, okay. This chapter is a bit more in detail. So this one goes detail in two ways. One is we are using real, real information. So actual real data here, instead of like, you know, having to generate our own data itself then kind of goes into a bit more detail of having, how do you get to that best fit model itself? And we kind of walked through a number of sample scenarios, um, mm -hmm. like, like this, um, this kind of diamonds data, things like that, to get us to like an eventual state of how to think through um, uh, model building itself. Okay. So I think I have read half of this chapter. I can go through it pretty quickly. So I think, um, our meeting here is probably going to be like 30, 35 minutes, maximum okay. for 14 minutes. Uh, but I, I'd also like to touch on the exercises itself because I think the exercises will probably make things a bit more friendly here rather than walking through the text okay. uh, uh, itself. Um, and I also not looked at the exercises, so it's be my first time also going through those exercises itself. Okay. Right. So given that entire introduction, let me just kick off the entire meeting. Right. So like I said, um, in our previous chapter, we learned about how linear model works um, and about some basic tools to understand you know, what the model is telling you about your data. In this case, we went to a bit more detail. So like, imagine the case where you have two types of variables, the continuous, the categorical. What do you do if you have two continuous or a categorical and continuous? Oh, okay. Also categorical variable itself. Um, okay. We approach that process. And the previous data was focused a lot more simulated data sets. So we had to use the data grid function to create our data sets from scratch. But on this one, we are going to work in with a real life exercise and trying to answer like, you know, trying to create intuition from real data uh, itself. And this chapter will show us how we can progressively build up a model to aid our yeah. understanding of the data, right? So we are going to take advantage of two major things. One. One is that we can partition a model into patterns and residuals. So pattern is where visualization comes in. Residuals mm -hmm. is, like I said, a, a linear regression, just the idea of what residual kind of presents if you want to get to a best fit uh, itself. Um, we can find patterns with visualization, then make them concrete and precise with a model. We then repeat this process and replace the old response variable with residuals from the model. So one of the things that I think the chapter is also trying to teach is the idea of iteration of a model itself, right? So a model is like an abstraction of like a larger data set. You are trying to make some sense of what that um, data set looks like. That's why you restrict everything to a model. Using that model, you can be able to understand larger data sets, but even that model itself, you would have to clean and tidy it up for you to, for you to get to a steady state of what you are looking okay. for in the large data set itself. Now, to get to that steady state, you can actually fall risk of um, chasing down a best fit uh, itself. Mm. And I think, I think they kind of touched on it at some point here. So he said, it's a challenge to know when to stop. You need to know, you need to figure out when your model is good enough for what you are looking for. Um, and when additional investments in trying to fine tune the model is unlikely to pay off. So this part, I kind of like this part because I think this part kind of adds the subjective part of whatever quantitative idea that this entire chapter is trying to preach okay. itself. 
for us to do this iteration work for large and complex data sets, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and there are obvious alternative approaches here. Uh, the one that I think everybody talks about a lot is this machine learning. It's very, uh, yeah. very it's well, well thrown around term. <laughs> I think my major problem in my own role, at least with machine learning is, I think you kind of touched on it here, is it's, yeah, I, I think this idea of black box is probably represents it. It's literally like, it's, it's like a blind model itself. It's just, it just, it spits out what your prediction is meant to be but you never have an idea of what's actually going on in that approach itself. So it completely takes away the entire power from your own intuition. And uh, you have to be extremely lucky if, if you have built your machine learning model in a most sensible way, so they are not like iterating or like most of the biases that you have in the model itself. At least that's what I've identified in my, in my, my own in my model. I, I don't know what you think. Yeah, you think yeah, about I, I think yeah i think it also depends though because there is um uh, what they call um expl explainable ai now mm -hmm. and then some mm -hmm. like okay. ethics ethics there's explainable ai and there's um ethics mm -hmm. in ai and um mm -hmm. i think another thing to it is just like okay right. it's like the way some of us also learns regression we just, I mean, mm -hmm. if I bring the X and Y together, I can do regression and mm -hmm. I can move ahead, you know. But there are mm -hmm. some people mm -hmm. that, you know, can actually interrogate what exactly is happening within, you know, within that model itself. And mm -hmm. that will be hearing things like an um, outlier, things like um, doing your F and all that and all that. So I think it depends mm -hmm. on who the person is. Yeah. So I'm also guilty yeah. of that. I just get yeah. the code, do my machine learning stuff, mm -hmm. and I move mm -hmm. on, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. so in that sense, you are just, it's a black box approach, uh -huh. you know, but uh -huh. some people actually interrogate the, the model itself. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, so it's it's either way, you are right uh -huh. in one way, it's more like uh -huh. a screen problem now. So you're like right in one way, and then in another way, one could say, okay, no, maybe depending on, you know, what is happening. But I mean, it's once it's statistics, there's always that issue. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. True, true, true. Thank, thanks for that. I think that's very, yeah. that's very useful. So in terms of prerequisites, um, uh, two major packages I think we're going to be using here. I think the first one is obviously the tidy diverse package yeah. and model R that we learned about in the previous chapter. Okay. Um, then that in terms of data sets, so yeah, then also the dates. Okay. So data sets, we are going to be focusing a lot more on uh, we're going to use this in, I think, the next sub topic itself. But this immediate one, we are going to be using <coughs> diamond ones. Okay. Itself. So we have seen these diamonds data before, I think, in the earlier parts of this entire book. And in previous chapters, we saw a surprising relationship between the quality of diamond and the price. And the surprising relationship was that low quality diamonds actually have higher prices. And low quality diamonds are reflected in terms of like in the cuts, in the colors and the clarity, right? And um, so let's start, let's try to visualize the entire diamond data set itself. So I think that will make things a bit more clear. So we create three different plots, right? Uh, with, three, with two different variables, uh, sorry, one different variable and one recurring variable here. So cut price, color price, clarity price, you view it as a box plot, right? Um, so this is the cut graph. This is the color graph and this is the clarity graph. Now, I guess it's a bit more explanation here. So they said that, note that the worst diamond color, which is J, that's this, slightly yellow, and the worst clarity, I1, that's this. Um, uh, uh, note that those are the two worst, <laughs> Was was diamond <laughs> interesting? Um, so I think that goes back to what they are trying to drag out here: the surprising relationship where low quality diamonds have higher prices. So that's the first thing that we kind of need to identify. The second thing is I think we're going to come back to this graph itself. But the second thing is if we now decide to look at the relationship between price and carats. So we've looked at price and you know three other variables itself. But we are assuming that each of these variables, cut, color, clarity, 
is covered in this variable itself, in this carrot, because it's supposed to represent the weight, which is supposed to be a factor in terms of the price. So, so it says, it looks like low quality diamonds have higher prices because there's an important confounding variable, which is the weight, right? The weight of the diamond is the single most important factor for determining the price of the diamond. And okay. low quality diamonds tend to be larger. I think if we see it here, that kind of shows up in this plot itself for these guys that are in this region, right? Um, in this yes. top right, right quadrant, uh, it's right. So they are quite heavy. They are quite heavy in terms of carat. Obviously, quite expensive. If you look at what the price is still saying. So yeah, okay. Just, I, I, like, okay. Like, just to ask, I mean, this could be a digression, but mm -hmm. the carat does it uh, determines the weight? I, I really don't know about diamonds, like. Um, I think that is a good point, actually. I, I think it does. I think it's probably best if we probably even do it here. So let me see if I can pull up. Uh, uh, actually, get the data set itself. I think, I think they had the units in the data set. Oh, okay. Um, not sure why this is not pulling up. I think it's still loaded. Well, I, I think I think they had the units in that I said. But yes, the idea is it's meant to represent the actual weight itself. Oh, okay. I think they touched it here, right? So they touched on it here, right? Look so at the, the weight of okay. the diamond. Right. Okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the weight is what is it was meant to be the single most important factor in determining okay. the price of the diamond. But you would also notice that you know when we are looking at this like the flagged here, low quality diamonds also have higher prices. Oh, and cool. the reason why they are flagging this is, yeah, that's a good question. The reason why they are flagging this is because those low quality diamonds end up having very high weights, which means they end up having very high price. Uh, and it's oh, okay. right. I, I think they thought on that conclusion itself at the end of this chapter, or oh, at, okay. at least at the end of this subtopic. Itself. Okay. So, so they said, we can make it easier to see how other attributes of a diamond affects the relative price by fitting the model to separate out the effect of carats. So this now goes to what we are aiming to do. So now I have a diamond data set. What I'm trying to understand is um, two things. One, uh, what's the usefulness of this data set itself? The major usefulness that we have identified here is obviously the price. What, how, what determines the price of that diamond data set itself? There are four variables that we have identified here, the cut, the color, the clarity, and also the cut. But we are seeing that each of these four variables have, uh, they, they somewhat have the same relationship with price, but we don't exactly know what each of these variables is kind of contributing itself to that price. And that's where we come to, is it possible that we can actually see our other variables or other attributes of diamonds um, affect that price by now start separating out each of those attributes itself, starting out with carat, right? Mm -hmm. So first, let's make a couple of tweaks to diamond data set to make it a bit easier to work with. I think the first thing that is kind of easy to see here is if I run a line across this, see that it kind of represents a curve. So shows that there's some sort of nonlinear equation that kind of happens here. That's possible to work with. It's just a lot more friendly for us to work with a linear curve because I guess the slope is a lot easier to deal with. For yes. us to do that here, you know, you cannot do log transformation, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to make sure that we are kind of working with a bit more streamlined data sets, we decided to focus on things that are smaller than 2.5 carats. So everything in this range, everything to the left of this 2.5 carats mm -hmm. itself, right? For mm -hmm. us to do these two things, we create this code here, right? So we run diamonds to create a new object diamonds to run our initial data set. We pipe it through filter, filter out the carat, so the 2.5, right? Mm. Then we create a mutate function where we are creating two extra colons. Our two colons is now the log transformation of the price and the log transformation of the carat. And now we get a straight line, right? Mm. Um, so together, this changes makes it easier to see the relationship between carat and price, obviously, because it's now a straight line. It's a lot easier to represent 
in an actual equation itself, right? Okay. To visualize this, our GG plots, we run diamond two, we now visualize the X and Y axis, and we bin them in terms of 50s, so that it's just a bit visible to the eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So now, now we can see a straight line curve. Now we can see what each of them currently kind of represents. Okay. So the log transformation is particularly useful here because it makes the pattern linear. So exactly what I was trying to say. Linear patterns are easiest to work with. Um, we can now take the next step here. Um, uh, let me take a step back here. So you notice at the beginning of this chapter, we said we should be careful about overfitting our information, overfitting the model itself. We are, we are getting there, right? We are not yet comfortable with this linear transformation that we have done here. We want to see if we can remove, we are, we are interpreting this linear transformation as a very strong linear pattern, right? So it's way too straight of a line. Is it possible that we can actually remove that strong linear pattern, right? One way to do that is, or before we actually even do that, we can actually run this to like a simple linear function, right? So create another object, run this through LM, L price, L carat, the data is diamond too. Literally, I just have to create this entire thing. I think this is like the regression function that we have in R uh, itself, right? Then we look at what the model tells us about the data. Note that I back transform the predictions on doing the log transformation so that I can overlay the predictions on the raw data. So you notice that now that we are here, we have removed the transformation that we did here because we identified that it was too straight of a linear line right just for us to end up here so the this curve that is here itself is not as steep as what we had here maybe for two major reasons one is because we have reduced this carat itself so we are obviously working with things that are less than 2.5 you can see that in i should be able to see that in um, in this x-axis itself so we're working with things that are a lot less than um 2.5 the other thing is you also notice that this the the values in each of these axes obviously is very different from what we had in our initial data set and that's one of the reasons why we are trying to strip out that log transformation itself so we still end up with a non-linear function but a lot more friendly to work with right so how do we get here to visualize this right so we run a grid diamonds to pipe it through data grid crat sequence range carat to 20 mutate you create two colons you create a colon um we are log two, we are doing log two of the carat form of the carat um variable we add predictions for more diamond call it l price uh we pipe this through mutate price is equals to two raised to power this itself uh, i guess that kind of gets us to where we're trying to end up here now to visualize all this obviously run that diamond two that we've created we color it red so we can see that line and we size it at one right so at the end, everything that we've tried to do here, we saw a data set that has very confounding interpretations. Then we ended up here where things are a lot more easier for us to see. So now it's, it's a lot more clearer for us to interpret a number of things. I guess the first thing here is, there's actually a max price that actually happens here. You notice that this line itself is very straight line. So everything kind of max out at like 19K itself. <clears throat> then you notice that our hypothesis on carat equals to weight should equal to i price doesn't actually work because there are certain individuals that are here that are on this 2.5 line by a lot more low price than guys that are on one carat itself right so things are becoming a bit more visible for us to see compared to how we had it up here uh, itself right um so this tells us something interesting about our data if we believe our model right the hypothesis that we had before, the enlarged diamonds are much cheaper than expected, right? So this large diamond that we have kind of costs less than 10,000. It's probably because no diamond in this data set costs more than 19K itself, right? So now, apart from just visualization, so the patterns that we're aiming for, which is where, <coughs> which is where we ended up here, we now want to look at residuals. Now we're looking at residuals, which helps us verify that we have successfully removed that strong linear pattern that we are aiming for. So again, diamonds to objects, add residuals, more diamond, everything that we created up here, we run it through this entire code again, then we visualize it. And now we can see this. I think this just represents 
this L residuals on the Y axis. Just give me a minute, please. <coughs> Take it easy. Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So he said, importantly, we can now redo our motivating plots um, using those residuals instead of the price. Right. So I guess things become a lot more interesting here. So instead of the way we did the cut price, color price, clarity price, but I deal with the residuals itself. Let's try at least the log transformation of the residuals. So run that's a box plot, right? So now we see the relationship that we expect. So let me just run through this interpretation and I'll go back to the picture. As the quality of diamond increases, so does its relative price. <coughs> you notice this part here. So like if I, if I look at this clarity itself, notice that as it increases, so does the price, right? To interpret mm. the y-axis, we need to think about what the residuals are trying to tell us and what scale they are on. The residual of negative one, that's this, indicates that, that the logarithm transformation of that price is one unit lower than the prediction based on solely, than, than the prediction based solely on its weight, based solely on the character, right? Yeah. So to respond yeah. one is one of one half. So points with value of minus one are half the expected price and values mm. and residuals with value one are twice the predicted price, right? So you know, that kind of shows up in this pattern itself. And it kind of also shows up in these other patterns that we currently have up here, right? So, so everything that we just went through is just to run through visualization, run through how to use residuals itself. So let's try to complicate things a bit more. We can continue to build on our model itself the idea that we're trying to get to a best fit. Yeah. Moving the effects of, moving the effects we've observed in the model to make it a bit more explicit. For example, uh, we could actually include the color cut and clarity into the model compared to how we have been working with just the carrots uh, into the model itself. So we can make, so we can also make explicit the effects of these three categorical variables. The problem here is obviously now includes four predictors. Um, so all this year, carats and everything here, which makes it easier for us to visualize. Now, I guess it's an important fact, and I guess this is where statistics kind of plays a role. <laughs> the good thing here is they're all independent, right? So they're all independent variables to each other, which means that we can plot them individually on four different plots. To make the process a lot easier, now we are going to use the dot model argument um, for a data grid. Just give me a minute, let me just get water from my kitchen. Just give no, me no problem. Minute. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so the model here now includes four predictors. It's getting, and it obviously gets quite harder to visualize. And so like I said, good thing is they're all independent variables. So we can plot them individually on four different plots. Now to make this a bit more easier, now that we have four different variables here, instead of using data grid, we can actually work with the dot model argument. So to do this, this is where the dot model argument kind of comes in. <clears throat> so to do this, we create an object grid through a diamond data set, diamonds two data sets. I think we kind of transform that data set somewhere around here. Right? Um, <clears throat> so, so we, uh, yep. So we create an object grid, run it through the, run the diamonds two data set through it. We pipe it through the data grid. And all our variables called model mod underscore diamond two uh, add predictions itself, right? So we kind of talked about these add predictions um, arguments in our uh, in this chapter in the model basic chapter itself. Essentially, what it just helps you do just generate some level of prediction in what you are what you are aiming for. So it shows up here, right? So I think it forms like what what you are aiming for the y variable to be itself. Right, so we try to plot this ggplot grid 
AS cut and the prediction itself, <clears throat> right? And um, so we can see, I mean, a fairly simple representation here. Just, we're just looking at just each variable cut and prediction itself. Very simple representation. Line looks almost straightforward, right? If the model needs variables that you haven't explicitly supplied, data grid will automatically fill them in with the typical value, right? So for continuous variables, it's going to use uh, a median. For category variables, it uses the most common value itself. So it's going to be the mode of values if there is a tie, right? So let's see how that kind of plays out here. So diamond two, diamond two, add residuals, mode underscore diamond two, this L residue two that we created earlier. We GG plot it and we actually end up here, right? Mm. So this plots in, the, I think I'm almost close to yeah, where I ended. So this plot indicates that there are some diamonds with large residuals, right? Obviously up here. Yeah. Right. Remember a residual of two indicates that a diamond is four times the price what we expected. It's often useful to look at unusual values individually. Right, and I think it's probably a bit better if you kind of look at this in a table format, right? So nothing really jumps out at me here, but it's probably worth spending time considering if this indicates a problem with our model or if, the, or if there are errors in the data set itself. If there are mistakes in the data, this could be an opportunity to buy diamonds that have been priced low incorrectly. So the entire idea, the hypothesis that we had around high carat diamonds being, um, um, high priced. For some reason, we are not seeing that play out when we actually dig into our data itself. So <clears throat> this can end up being an anomaly, or it can end up being that individuals that are selling this probably have it a bit more low price. And I think that's what they are trying to flag here. Yeah. So this thought process goes back to everything that we've been trying to say. So iterating on the model itself till you get to what your steady state looks like. Mm -hmm. So depending on what the work stream looks like, you can actually think where you've ended the years. Steady stream, if you know, if you kind of feel that's where it's like, but what this beginning part is just trying to teach on is <clears throat> iterating on the model itself through visualization and getting residuals to get you to what that best fit model is going to look like, right? Mm -hmm. So there are four major exercises here. We could probably just run through the exercises. Um, then I think I have my R open up somewhere yeah yeah so i don't think they actually had that unit that they flagged here so well, i think it's fine so let, let's run through the exercises so we we'll just do this this 24.1 exercises and kind of close it off from there so that that will be this one okay so let's start from the beginning so it said in the plot of L carats versus L price, there are some bright vertical stripes. What do they actually represent? Right? Let me see if I can go to this. Mm. Uh, so that would be this one, right? So the vertical, what do they call it? The, the bright vertical stripes. Mm. What do they actually represent? Interesting. <clears throat> So you said the distribution of diamonds has more diamonds at round or otherwise human friendly numbers. I'm not sure what this means. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think what they are trying to flag is this bright spots itself. So this these bright spots that are showing up here, um, what exactly do I represent? I mean, that's an interesting thought process. I just, I'm not sure what it represents mm -hmm. itself. So he said, if log price is equal to this particular function, what does that say about the relationship between price and carats, right? So he said from the example in the chapter, let's try to use base two log within here. So if I create an object, mode log, <clears throat> I run it through this um, linear function, log two price, log two carats. Um, okay. Then I try to see what this mode log represents, right? So okay. the coefficient here is, that's an intercept of 0.19 and slope of um, 1.68. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the estimated relationship between carat and price <clears throat> will look like this. So let's try to do this. So 
right? So we've generated a prediction here with this coefficient using this work here. I run this trick, Cebu, uh, create a character with a sequence of um, 0 0.25 to 5 by, so I, I um, the, the, uh, um, the, the spacing in between each of this would be 0 0.25. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I add predictions mod log and I ggplot this. That should be what is represented here. So he said the plot shows that the estimated relationship between carats and price is not linear. The exact relationship in this model is if X increases by out times, I think, I think this just explains what a non-linear equation is. X increases by out times, then Y increases by R raised to power A one times. For example, a two times increase in carats associated with the following increase in price, right? So two times increase in carats increase in price okay so to confirm this relationship we can check for a few values of the current variable for example increasing the current from one to two right and i think we're running through everything we have created here so two raised to power this particular value and we get to 3.2 so raised to power this value minus value itself we get 3.2. Note that since predict predicts log two carats rather than carat, this prediction is exponentiated by two. Now let's increase carat from four to two. Okay. It's one, four to two. <coughs> so finally, let's increase the carat from 0 0.5 to one. So he said all these examples return the same variable, 3.2. Why is this? If we ignore the names of the variables in this case and consider the equation, okay? Let me see if it's the same thing as what we have here. Okay. okay. We want to understand how the difference in Y is related to the difference in X, okay? Now consider this equation at two different values, X1 and X4, okay? What's going between this? log BYO and log BY1. So the difference would be <clears throat> this, this. So this, this function here minus this function here. Yeah. Okay, so AO, uh -huh, uh -huh. A1 log BX1, AO, A1 log BXO, right? Which will give you this particular value. If you want to take out the A1 as the, yeah. um, the value that is most consistent. Then you get log b one, okay, okay. Because it's a minus function, you get log b this. Then y one y o x one. Okay, cool. So if if s is equals to y one over y o and r equals to x one over y o, I guess we get we end up here. Yeah. Right. So essentially, I guess what this guy is trying to walk through is how is it possible that we cannot end up in this entire position if we are looking at this function itself and you know just walking through this entire function. You see, at the end, we kind of end up there. So this is very similar to our two raised to power A1, which equals to the S. So this 3.2 represents this Y1 over Y0, <clears throat> and this two here represents this X1 over X0. In other words, a R time increase in X, right, is associated with the R raised to power A1 times increase in Y, okay? Note that this relationship does not depend on the base of the logarithm. Fair, that makes sense. Um, there is another approximation that is commonly used when logarithms appear in regression. It's a very long-winded explanation. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the first way to show this is using the approximation x is small, meaning that x is getting towards zero, right? So one over one plus x equals to getting equals zero. Then this approximation is the first order Taylor expansion, fair, um, at x equals to zero. Now consider the relationship between the percentage change in x and position change in Y, right? Mm -hmm. At the end, we do we end up at the same point. I think that's what this guy is trying to trying to drag at itself. But I mean, this this becomes a bit more mathematical. Uh, but the, the thought uh, process is we you do end up here if you actually decide to split out the what this function kind of looks like itself. And he decided to show that in two major ways. One is an arithmetic expression of what this represents. The other is if you decide to actually use the first order Taylor expansion, <laughs> I think this is like matrix algebra or something like that. And you kind of have to walk through. Um, That's calculus. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, that you kind of have to walk through to kind of get here itself. So okay. plus 1% change in X, just with a beta percent change in Y, 
this relationship can also be derived by taking the derivative of log y uh, with respect to x. First, we write the equation in terms of y. Okay, fair. Uh, okay, okay. Very similar to the expression that we actually have above here. <clears throat> right? But we're using an exponential, not the logarithm here. Fair. Um, then differentiate y with respect to x. So essentially, we're going to end up at the same point. We're just using different, um, yeah. different ways to get there. So A, you can actually use it using an arithmetic expression with this, or you can use it doing like a derivative idea itself, which you're just trying to be a bit fancy now you think through it. But at the end, we end up there, right? So we end up on the same point where this entire exercise is kind of aiming for. <clears throat> so let, let, me, let me end with this 2.4. 24.2.3. Right. So this one says um, extract diamonds that are very high and very low residuals. Is there anything unusual about these diamonds? Are they particularly bad or good? Or do you think these are pricing errors? Okay. So let's 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 run the entire exercise again. <clears throat> so I think it's kind of where we ended up when we we're looking at if there were guys that had like high karate itself and why, why they are not being priced high enough. Mm. Okay. So diamonds mm. two, we filter it for just the residuals, the absolute values of the residuals, greater than one. We add predictions, mutates, create a new column. We select particular variables that we want to look like, that we want to look at, and we arrange them by price uh, itself, right? So this is the price variable. So we're trying to arrange this, taking in ascending order. Um, so it said, we don't see anything unusual, do we? Um, <clears throat> so A would probably be guys with low price. So I'm guessing this is what a low price is going to be since this is arranged in ascending order. Should obviously have low quality. So we're looking at um, uh, quality in terms of cut, color, and clarity, right? So I think we identified that. <clears throat> I think J was our highest um color itself um, for us to have and we can't see that on the stream itself so it does it seems like things actually check out here um so the price definitely corresponds to what we can see on the carat except if i'm missing something right but as the carat obviously increases here right know, except when we get to this point right? yeah we also, have one, obviously... we also have a one point we also have a one point carat mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Interesting. So, so I guess this is actually the anomaly itself, then, right? So, this we we'll probably expect that this this one point zero three carats will probably be a lot a lot down in the entire data set because yeah. it's supposed to have high price. So, I think this is probably one of the first anomalies that we can identify here. Yeah, but maybe another thing we can also look at the cut. The cut is just fair; it's not even premium. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. could also ac account for. I mean. I, I don't deal in rare in, in minerals, so I might not know. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, I might not know. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. All right. But I, I, I think the idea is fairly straightforward itself, though. Yeah. So we'll probably get into yeah. the midst of this entire, entire chapter, like the next 50% of the chapter itself, with a different data set, so NYC flights. Um, okay. but, but the major idea of this model building itself is <clears throat> literally two things. Uh, we, we iterate on a model using two processes, generating patterns and working with it. If we have this and we keep it on the model, we can see a bit more idea of what the model represents and use mm. that abstraction to kind of generate thought processes on what the larger data set is trying to preach. I mm -hmm. think that's what this model building idea is trying to trying to show us itself. So, mm -hmm. but each each sub topic just goes into different data sets as we kind of walk through. So the first one is the diamond data set. The second one is going to be this NYC flight. So I think we are going to order data sets as we kind of go forward uh, itself. So we'll touch on NYC flights in our next in our next meeting itself. Then we can close up with our next uh, the final chapter, which is working with this poor and boom uh, itself as, in terms of functions. I hope everything I've said so far kind of makes a bit of sure. sense. Sure, sure, sure. And thank you very much for 
Fantastic. With this, yeah, this is very nice. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time, Sadia. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. Bye.